here on uh, Mixmag uh, about the unhealthy scene. They're talking about, I think, the rise of uh, DJ fees. It's something I've spoken about for a while on here on this podcast. I think I've kind of spoken about it's ad nauseum, but you know what? It's a podcast. We're going to speak about it again. So um, this is from Mixmag. It's called Unhealthy Scene, how high sky high DJ fees are crippling the dance music scene. Click it here, actually, before I kind of carry on. Um, the answer is the following. We're facing a crisis in club culture, but this time our antagonist isn't the government, the media, or the greedy landlords. The reason for this um, crisis are many, but without reigning... Well, we've got raining in out control DJ fees. Many predict the clubbing bubble will burst, potentially crashing all but the biggest idiots, events, and promoters. Now, I'm going to do something um, controversial here, and I'm going to defend DJs who request a high DJ fee and cripple clubs. I think there was an era, personally, for me speaking in my experience, being a promoter, being a DJ, being a nightlife aficionado, that there was an era in time when clubs were getting away with murder and essentially undercharging DJs not being transparent about who they, who they book, no, how much they're paying DJs, and just generally being a bit slimy. In the DJ world, or just in work in general, it's very rare that people kind of discuss their salaries with people, like with your colleagues, but I'm very much so for it. I think more people in the same industry should be open about how much they get paid so that people know where they fall on, where they fall on the totem pole and also know what they can demand. I think part of the reason why we have this big issue or we have this big drive with some venues wanting to have better representation on the DJ London is because most of these places were booking the same people, right? And also it felt as if to me, there wasn't any transparency between the men, forget the women involved, so when the women got involved, the transparency went completely out of the blue because for the most part, the clubs were trying to make up for all the bad stuff they did previously and were essentially overpaying the female DJs who probably weren't as experienced as they could, as they needed to be in order to command that fee, which then would create some weird animosity between the men and the women that doesn't need to exist because we're all in this together. I think if we were able to all just come in together into one room, be open about what we get paid, everyone could demand a different fee because... The most frustrating thing is when you go and play somewhere and you find out somebody that you think is not as good as you has got paid more and you know they're not bringing people to the club because, you know, the, the bringing people to the club thing is fair, fine and dandy. I think everyone with a brain knows the DJs out there who are able to command, um, who command a high fee and also can bring people through the door. I look at people that scream and stuff, right? Even though he's got, you know, 20 plus year history in, in, in electronic music or in DJing in general and he's not even someone you can play with in terms of being actually a technical DJ. No one can deny that, you know, he should get paid a bit more because when he puts out a tweet, when he puts out an Instagram, he can move tickets. We've seen it before. We've seen him do it with his own little headline tour that he's doing now. The, or little. He's doing a, a UK, an, is it a UK? Yeah, nationwide uh, tour now at the moment, playing in all these random places all over the country in places that aren't necessarily the cultural hotspots, but just kind of laying it down, shelling. And for the most part, people are all having a good time. So if you hear he gets paid more than you, but you've got 20 years experience too, you won't going to be too um, annoyed by it. So that's one thing. So DJs will kind of like, you know what? I'm just going to request what I want to request. And if you want to book me, you want to book me, that's it. Then another thing too, I think, is the club's fault too. I think the clubs in the UK, especially the ones in London, they don't book resident DJs. They don't have resident DJ nights. They're all their, all of the club's um, nights, especially the Fridays and Saturdays, are usually um, withheld or reserved for big promoters who are able to obviously uh, fill up the club or it's reserved for big DJs who are obviously able to fill up the club. So in that sense, when they reach a kind of barren month, a barren week, an odd time in the calendar, and the club isn't as full anymore, it doesn't make any sense to overpay your promoters or to overpay your DJ in order to kind of play to a half-empty room, right? So they end up killing themselves that way because it, I think in a year, a club will probably be lucky to get 10 nights that are profitable. Most of the time, you're kind of trying to break even, right? So if you're lucky to get 10 nights that are profitable, why wouldn't you try to offset some of that fee by having uh, a whole library Rolodex full of really of really cool, amazing, solid, high quality resident DJs that you can play that you can kind of have spread out along the entire of the year to kind of pick up any slack along the way. And by and large, anyway, electronic music, um, the fund the foundations of it, especially some of the bigger acts that we know nowadays, they have all come from the resident DJ lineage. That's where they came from. They came from being able to play week in week out in front of a packed crowd, in front of a, a diverse crowd. Uh, different crowd week in week out build up their uh, get their sets and reps in so that when they were able to to give the opportunity to play at a big club like a fabric a ministry of sound they could automatically shell that place down because they've got a whole 
a bevy of experience playing, you know, six months in a nightclub somewhere in the middle of central London every Friday and Saturday. But because that doesn't happen, those DJs don't develop. So then what ends up happening, you have a whole group of DJs at the moment. I think from the landscape, there's like a real big gap between the people at the bottom and the people in the middle. And then the bigger gap between people in the middle and the top. Because that bottom and middle group of DJs, that group, that, that gap should be closer because the, the bottom should be playing, you know, every resident. They should be filling up every resident DJ spot all around London. And the ones in the middle should be warming up for the big acts so that they're closer together. But because we don't have any resident DJ spots, the guys at the bottom are just not playing anywhere, right? I'm one of the fortunate ones where I, where I have the ability to play every month, a couple of weekends here and there at local bars and pubs. But I'm sure there's better DJs than me out there who have been playing longer than I have who play maybe once every three months that's not enough mixing at home can never ever never ever replace playing in front of people even if it's for half an hour the ability to play in front of people and make strangers dance that don't want to see you that don't know who you are is the way that you get better at DJing but the only way you're going to get better at DJing is playing in front of people and the only way they're going to do that is the clubs give those DJs opportunity to play in their buildings but they don't in their nightclubs they don't they would rather reserve it for high profile DJs book them all pay the pay the um, pay the booking fee for each DJ, which is, I don't know, a grand each, hardly make that at the bar and then complain that, you know, it's the it's the DJ's fault for requesting more money. It's not. It's a club's fault, 100%. It continues. Almost everyone I spoke to agree on where the problem is, but few agree on who's to blame. Uh, ben Rao, a DJ and promoter and label owner from Berlin, highlights the top 1% of DJs who are making a disproportionate share of the pie, which is not a bad thing. I think in any industry that you look at, the top one percent, the top five or one percent are the ones that are accountable for the majority of the right for the majority of the money. They, they can command the highest fee. It's just the same everywhere. It happens in football, happens in music and hip hop, happens in literature, happens in podcasting. It happens. It's not a big thing. I think it's even more of a surprise for some people in the electronic music scene because we've seen it happen with the women. They went. They wanted um, equal representation. They wanted diversity in the in the in the field, which I'm a big fan of because having been to warehouse rave after warehouse rave, it gets a bit boring having to see the same white dude wearing all black playing behind a DJ deck. So it's because it's not because there's a white dude, just because aesthetically and sonically, they just, they just all play the same shit. So to have somebody a bit different, come from a different background, different gender, different experiences, that might make the rave a bit fresh. So I'm not against it, but it's funny to see that. The same thing that's happened that occurred in the men's field with the top five or one percent earning the majority of the money is also happening in the women's DJ field. It's the same five or six girls that are commanding all the big headlining spots and festivals, all the big headlining spots, all the big major clubs, and again, all and they're predominantly the ones that are climbing up the charts. Everyone else is kind of scrambling for the scraps. So the same thing has basically happened. Anyway, it continues. Um, others like Dan Sumner of Pretty Pretty Good think booking agents are often at fault when so many agents are unwilling to negotiate artist fees. Independent promoters and smaller parties can struggle to break even. Again, your fault. You should try to maybe have a night where you promote some resident DJs or if effectively have a night that people, because you rarely do you now get parties in London, maybe apart from three or four promoters, where you go specifically for the promoter. Well, like when we used to put on So Special at the Alibi, part of the reason why it kind of stagnated was because there was demand to always book really interesting headline DJs, right? To play and then you fill it up with your friends and family. Then it got to a point where we couldn't base, there wasn't anyone else we could find that was in our budget. So essentially we had to just pick our friends and family and then turn the party into essentially this whole like community hangout thing where we got to see all our friends at the end of the month, we're working hard, you get to see, you know, work hard, play hard sort of thing. But there's not many nights in London that do that. Most of the nights in London have this thing where they want to book a big DJ. They don't really do a thing where they're just like, it's going to be a good night, right? Um, maybe Secret Sun, maybe um, Secret Sundays is a one example. They have a good way of kind of, yeah, they maybe have a good way of doing it where you kind of go for the party. World Unknown 2 is a good one too. They don't really have big headline DJs and it's usually a lot of friends and family that they kind of get into play. Uh, promoters don't do that enough. They don't take enough chances. The easy thing to do is to go on SoundCloud, go on Resident Advisor, go on DJ Mag, go on Reddit, go on Twitter, go on Instagram, find a really up and coming DJ. No, up kind of, or like a DJ that you can book within your kind of price range that also has a bit of a name and then get them to play at your club. That's easy. The thing that's difficult is to pluck kids out from the from the UE for people that no one's really aware of um be able to make it a cohesive lineup and then kind of put it out somewhere and get people to come down because it's gonna be a good night that's the hardest thing and that's something a lot of promoters in London haven't necessarily figured out maybe it's because of the licensing laws people don't want to take chances because there's not enough time basically in the night to make 
that work right maybe i don't know but i think there is a time i think especially nowadays where people are a bit picky about where they go to um maybe just having a party that's fun would be more interesting than people booking djs to go to because if you're gonna if you're gonna go see a dj you're just gonna you're just gonna go to a big mega club like fold or print works or whatever like you're just gonna go there you won't necessarily waste your time going to like a little night in corsica studios not a little night but you know what i mean you wouldn't we won't necessarily waste your time going there you, you'd rather go there just to go for a good night a good party like i don't go to corsica studios to go to to see a lineup i go there because it's a good little venue in brixton right but i don't know maybe i'm wrong um it continues um i do love promoting says uh this guy from pretty pretty good um but it's exhausting stressful and it's unsustainable for independent promoters to make money out promoting with the way things are um after four years of events such in cities like bristol sheffield manchester and leeds summers ending his party this month oh really okay the costs are too high to make it comfortable but the biggest factor is dj fees again i think where there's a world is a way i think one person says you can't do it one person says you can do it um i think origins is a good example um in mixed garage fair enough they book some high profile guests but for the most part i go there for the event i go there because it's a good vibe i also go to mix because it's a good event if mix were able to put on a resident dj night on a friday and saturday i think they'll fill it quite well i think people trust mix as a as a, as a club the same way they would trust maybe a fold the same way they would trust the fabric the same way they would trust the plastic people back in the day i think the community of people inside the club make the club as opposed to the lineup in the venue some djs even the bigger djs out there will tell you like when they go to a city and they go to a, a club that's amazing how many of you have you heard saying oh yeah i went to this nightclub in the city that i played in it was was really cool it was really amazing i was so happy when the booking agent or the promoter contacted me and asked me to play i really wanted to play there right there that does happen that story where djs actually want to go play somewhere because they went there to party and love the vibe um and that's important but i don't but clubs in london places in london don't really have that idea i don't know why it is even bars sometimes even bars and pubs places are not even quintessential quote unquote nightclubs are a bit hesitant to get resident djs in they'd rather get like headline people to come and play it's like well, what's the point of getting a headline DJ to go play at the, I don't know, at the Claps in the Heart or something? It doesn't make any sense, right? You'd rather just have a resident DJ list and just rotate them week in, week out so people go know to when to come to see a certain DJ play at their bar um, because for the most part, people don't really want to see a DJ in those venues. Maybe, again, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. It continues, uh, post humans, uh, just Doherty, who runs a label party called I Love Acid, faults the sponsored festivals and promoters with deep pockets who are able to pay inflated fees, which increases its global board. Agents expect those fees as a result. And though Abby Blankett's fabric head of promotion says he doesn't want to point fingers at anyone, we've all been complicit in this, where the scene got, where the scene's got to and it's breaking. But of course, we all have fought. And I think this idea that there's all these uh, finance boys in Liverpool Street Station at Liverpool Street offices, wherever it may be, uh, pulling resources together and putting on a festival or club night and booking Dixon and, I don't know, Solomon and stuff to play. And that's all what's hurting the scene. That's ridiculous. How many of those people actually exist? How many people of them, how many are willing to actually put their money on the line and risk losing it just to put on a party so they can say that they they got Solomon to play at their event? Not many people, right? So I think that is neither here or there. I think the problem, again, maybe it's partly to do with the consumers. Consumers probably... There is probably a need for consumers to want to go see big DJs play in places and they're not that comfortable just to go and trust a venue or trust a promoter, wherever it may be. But I think it is that does happen. I think I look at some of the forest raves I used to go to in Hackney Wick. Um, I couldn't name you one person that played there, but I used to go there religiously every Sunday after a rave or something, after a warehouse rave, because I trusted the people that put on the party to put on a good night or to put on a good event outside, right, in the middle of a forest in Hackney Wick. So if they can do it, I think you can then take that same methodology, that same idea and, and allow it to live in a club. Now, clubs are a bit difficult because obviously they have budgets to look after. They've got to pay staff. They have to take a particular amount at the bar in order to break even. But if they're willing to maybe test the waters a little bit, know that they're going to go through a few, through a few roughy, rough patches, but let the promoter actually stick there and maybe have the first two weekends of the month, month in, month out. Um, and then have your same residents play all the time and then get the crowd to be um, not educated, but get the crowd understanding of what to expect. I think they'll be fine. Honestly, I think they'll be fine. But again, no one's willing to take that chance. So because of that, everyone's more easy. It's more easy to kind of point fingers at DJs that are earning all the big bucks. They don't matter, man. These are playing massive festivals and playing, you know, all the best clubs in the world. They're always going to operate at that higher echelon. It's about looking after the middle and the bottom of the scene because that's what is actually that's actually what keeps the scene alive. 
because you know you're not going to get another superstar dj unless you kind of look after the middle and bottom anyway that's where they come from um especially nowadays you're gonna you know i look at someone like uh dj high who used to play at the what you call it at the pub on on dawson lane right dj high and now she's suddenly blown up and become a big successful dj just through of that residency someone seeing her noticing her booking her at phonox and then suddenly she's blown up i think those stories only happen when somebody's get given a residency in a little pub pub or club somewhere in dawson lane and then you get to kind of build up from there but without that it's very difficult to do so um again i think a lot of people are to blame this article is quite long i think you guys can check it out and read it for yourself but um, I kind of give you the overall uh, structure or the overall theme of it. Um, let me know what you think of it once you've read it. Leave a comment down below and then we can discuss further.